March 8th meeting, call meeting of the Sport, M M Metropolitan Sports Authority to order. Um, at this time, I'd like to recognize uh, District 6 Council Member Brett Withers, who is with us again this morning. We also have District 8 Council Member Nancy Van Rees. Good to see you, Nancy. And we also have, have Council Member at Large Sharon Hurt with us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we're so appreciative of the service, and especially we are especially grateful for um, Council Member Van Rees' work on the National Im Needs Impact Fund. You made mention of that at our last meeting, and uh, I'd like to give you a few moments if you'd like to give us any kind of update at this point. Yeah, thank you very much. It is. Um, really been my pleasure to be a part of the momentum that we have on bringing professional women's sports to Nashville. And there are actually a couple of leagues that are already professional and we wanted to make sure and acknowledge them as we continue to look for franchise opportunities with the big ones, right? Um, the amendment to the resolution last night was very warmly received by my colleagues. Uh, for those of you who may not have missed it. We've actually added to the Nashville Needs um, Impact Fund the clarification that was really the original intent of all the parties to begin with that includes that the fund may also be used for the provision of resources to entities related to professional women's sports infrastructure, promotion, marketing, and direct recruitment. And it removed um, the word nonprofit entities to qualified entities, which allows a number of different um, struggling for profit women's groups that are paying players and building small leagues. And it also directly impacts our ability to continue to find carrots to bring uh, franchises uh, here to the city. So, uh, I'm particularly um, proud of this particular thing, not only because we were able to uh, confirm uh, with the administration and with the Titans that that indeed was the original intent, but that the Metro Council overwhelmingly approved it as well. So it's my pleasure to bring that news to you today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Any questions for Council Member Van Rees? Thank you so much. We're all excited about that news. <clears throat> As you know, this is the first of several work sessions scheduled to review documents and ask questions relative to the new stadium deal. Uh, this morning, we have Deputy Mayor Sam Wilcox, Finance Director Kelly Flannery, Deputy Law Director Tom Cross, and Jeff Oldham with Bassberry and Sims Metro's Bond Council with us this morning. Uh, my understanding is that we're gonna focus on the development and stadium lease agreement today and uh, we will probably have one and possibly two sessions to follow, but there will be follow-up sessions. Uh, so we will reconvene again on March 20th to pick up the next piece. So I'm asking that the board feel free to um, ask questions. We're gonna see a pretty sizable uh, deck, uh, slide deck today. And uh, I would also encourage you in, in the moment, if you have uh, questions, not to wait till the end, but let's really dive deep into this so that we can make the best of this time. So with that being said, um, I will turn it over to the administration. kick us off um, as we get set up here this morning. Thank you to all of you for uh, your time this morning and uh, what we're asking over the next couple of weeks. Um, these work sessions are, as, as we promised at the last uh, meeting, you know, these work sessions are to ensure that you all feel like um, you have ample opportunity to review the documents, ask questions, dig into the details, challenge us on these points, um, and uh, um, ultimately be able to make your best recommendation to um, the city and Metro Council. Um, 
today you'll hear from mostly the other folks up here at this table um, walking through these slides. Um, again, feel free to interrupt, ask questions, um, and happy to uh, spend time um, in this meeting over email. We can redistribute to all board members, try and collect questions um, as we go along. But um, thank you again for all, all your time this morning. Hey there, I'm Kelly Flannery, uh, finance director. I don't know who's manning the deck, but thanks for advancing the slide. Um, my role today will hopefully be fairly limited in that um, we're going to focus on the documents today. And um, this was a not my most elegant uh, slide, but it was meant to depict um, all of the conversations we've had on this topic to date. And it is definitely not representative of all the work that the sports authority has done. It really, the only sports authority kind of um, that, made, that made the chart and still made it manageable were those that actually had kind of designated meetings. So I, I do want to um, appreciate for those that are listening, there were a lot more conversations that this body entertained both through the administration, um, the finance department, as well as uh, the team. So um, just looking forward with what the next eight or so weeks look like, it's been a little bit of a Jenga puzzle, but I think we've come up with a, a schedule that allows us to kind of um, cover the same topic with both Budget and Finance Committee and Sports Authority, at least in the same week. And in most cases, we were able to get it on the same day. So um, I'm hopeful that that all works out. And so by design to the starting today and in the meeting on the 20th, we will start with a walkthrough of the documents. Um, it's kind of hard to talk about the finances unless you know what we've got in the documents. So we'll run through those first. And today will be primarily um, Jeff from Bassberry, Tom Cross from uh, Metro Law. And then on the 20th, we expect to have some representatives from Greenberg Trarg who's been uh, assisting us. They have a lot of expertise in developing uh, agreements with across all sports, but almost every NFL um, agreement in the last decades they've touched and had um, hands on. So they will be here to explain both what's in the documents and if you have any questions about how it compares and contrasts to other documents that other teams have executed. I think there'll be a great resource there. On the 28th, um, that'll be the what we're calling the financing plan meeting, but it will encompass kind of more than that. How did we get to our assumptions around mm -hmm. revenues that is building the financing plan? And for that, we expect to have um, external consultants, both on the real estate side, the development, as well as um, in the stadium. How did we get to the assumptions that we've come to? And then uh, Goldman Sachs has been selected to serve as underwriter for Sports Authority. They will be here to walk through a proposed financing plan and provide some intel. We've been working to get some non-binding commentary from the rating agencies, and they will share that feedback as well. And then the subsequent meeting, I guess, is the third, fourth, um, kind of wh whatever's left, wh whatever questions we have left from that point, if there's anything outstanding. I will add, as I mentioned, we are doing budget and finance at the same time, and I appreciate this is a huge commitment already, but it, there could be things that that group asks that this one doesn't. So if you have the availability, I would encourage you to watch those any way you can. But we are available. If you have questions, feel free to submit them to us in any form or fashion. We will do that similarly to council members and they will be publicly available so we can distribute those to this group as well as, as those come out. But, um, I just hope as we contemplate this for the next eight weeks, you will know that we are here for any questions you have because we do appreciate, well, the terms haven't materially changed from the term sheet. It is a lot of paper and there's a, a lot of there there. So we are here to identify it. And with that, go. You get two microphones. <laughs> so so let, let me, um, I guess before I get started, let me say three things. The, the first is to echo what the chair said. Please ask, ask questions as we go. We want this to be useful. This is ultimately your time. We're here for you. The second thing I'd say is reiterate what Kelly said. Greenberg Traurig, um, brought a lot of expertise here about what is market, you know, in, in NFL pro sports deals like this. And you combine what they brought to like, particularly the Metro Department of Law, you know, their experience with other deals like this, Metro's history 
is sort of what you're seeing in front of you, sort of a marrying up of those two things. <clears throat> and the last thing I'll say is, if this session is successful at all, it's, it is due in large part to your executive director. My inclination is always to try to do way too much, way too fast, and that was where I was headed. And she said, slow down, let's, let's focus. And so what you're gonna have today in front of you really is a focus on what does it mean for this board to be the landlord you know, for the next three years as you, you know, sh should this be approved as you oversee the development of a new facility, continue to maintain the facility that you've already got, and then, and then be the landlord of a new facility for 30 years. And so we have focused exclusively on that. And you've got this big stack of documents in front of you, but we're only gonna, we're gonna focus on three, the development agreement, the amendment to the existing lease, which covers really those two documents cover the next Three to, three to four years, three years, and then the stadium lease, which would cover the 30 years after the stadium opens. So those, those are the ground rules. Um, so I've, I've hit on that. You, you know, the, the other agreements, you know, as Kelly said, we'll come back to these. And, and I, I hope once we get the backbone of these three, the rest of them just sort of fall into place. And so that's gonna be the approach. Excuse me, uh, before yeah. you begin, sure. I apologize for asking. What is your name? Yeah, no, hey, I'm happy to talk about me. Um, I'm Je <laughs> Jeff Oldham, at, okay. uh, I'm an attorney at Basbury and Sims. And so we've served as bond counsel to this board and Metro for a long time. Um, and really I'm sort of the, I think the organizer here and the play by, Tom tells me I'm the play by play guy and he's gonna be the color commentator <laughs> for, these, for these documents. <clears throat> So there, that's what we're talking about today, sorry. Um, so just, you know, who's who, some of this is obvious. You, you, you obviously know who you are. Um, we know who Metro is. You're gonna see references to two team entities. There's a STADCO, um, which is, you know, the, the entity, the corporate uh, entity of the team that's responsible for developing the stadium and operating the stadium. They're gonna be party to certain agreements. You'll see their name. There's also Teamco, the, the franchise holding entity. It's a different entity. They're affiliated. You'll, you'll see those. Um, it's, a, it's a distinction that's in there. Um, and then you'll see references to TSU, no surprise there. And so as you think about those things, we're gonna try at every point to relate this new deal to deals you've seen, deals you're party to. And so here's, here's the first one. You know, here's your current legal structure. I have sure. one more question. Absolutely. Will you be following this binder and the way we received it? Uh, yeah, let's, so, okay, let's do this. So um, this is all lead into the development agreement. Okay, okay. So if, right, you wanna, if you wanna flip to the development agreement, and that's, that's where we're gonna start. And that and what's is, that um, what, tab, tab A. a. Tab Sorry about that. Okay. So I think we're gonna be doing tab A, B, and D. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Uh, <coughs> yeah, skipping intergovernmental. Yes, Dean. Jeff, before e, you I'm move sorry. off of this yeah. slide, one other clarification question. Cumberland Stadium Incorporated will be our tenant. Tennessee football, the will not, will be, is an affiliate of Cumberland? Yeah, and, and let's, and so, yeah, that's, so the, these slides, that's a very good question. And let's start on So your existing, your existing structure is, your tenant is Cumberland Stadium Inc. This is the, this is this building, right? not, there will be a new corporate entities here. Um, Cumberland Stadium, they are your tenant. They then have a contract, sublease, call it whatever you want to call it. In the old deal, it's called a team contract, where they, um, and it's sort of, it's a, it's a formality, really. They then make the stadium available to the team itself. And these are the same two entities that are rolling into the new S So, you, you, they're going to be the same. They'll have different names, technical corporate names. They're LLCs, for example, but exactly the same structure. And then under the current structure, TSU is a direct lessee of yours. It's like a three-way agreement, Sports Authority, uh, Cumberland, uh, St Stadco. I'm calling it Stadco, but this Stadco, um, it's a three-way agreement. The new deal is, um, is almost identical. You will have a, another in a Tennessee Stadium LLC, so not Cumberland per se, but also a Stadco. Your relationship's just the same. There will be a team sublease just like there is now. The only difference in the new structure and the old is that TSU's arrangement, which 
I think everybody's operating under the understanding that they are essentially identical to the current arrangements. Um, that would be through a sublease with STADCO rather than directly with the Sports Authority. So as you think about who's who and how this all looks, I just want to make sure we're relating it to what you, you've got now. And the only real difference is the TSU arrangement is a sublease rather than a, um, than a direct lease. Um, just so, you know, for a visual, you know, you can sort of see, you know, the, the sort of at the bottom of the page, the circle there, that's where we are today. I don't think any of this, this slide's a surprise to anybody. The new stadium, you know, is just to the east. And if I can also say, and this may be helpful, there's a, a little bit, there's another map so that if you just need to refer to it, even when we're on a different page, it's in your binder and it's a little bit bigger. Where is it? In your, and it should be in the pocket. And, and so now, Good question. So we, which agreements are we starting with? The development agreement. And so that was all sort of a long lead into the development agreement itself. And Tom and I thought it'd be a good idea. You know, your more, your most recent development agreement, and some of you lived through this, was Geodis Park. And so we thought, okay, well, let's just, you know, let's compare and contrast this development agreement to that one. Um, as it relates to project funding responsibility, the, you know, the numbers are different, but the overall structure is pretty similar. Geodis Park, you guys chipped in a fixed amount, $225 million. The team funded the balance of project costs and cost overruns. Same story here. You're chipping in a fixed amount, 760, the number we've been talking about now for several months. The state is, a, is an additional funding source that was not present in Geodis Park. And then STADCO for, for the new stadium will do you know the same thing, the balance of project costs plus cost overruns. So that piece looks pretty similar. The second line item, design and construction of responsibility, is the part that looks different. In Geodis Park, the Sports Authority, I'm leaning on Tom here too, because Tom's the construction expert, so correct me when I go astray. Um, you have it. I know, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I've got too many things going on. Sorry. <laughs> There's a slide. So design and construction responsibility is different. In Geodis Park, the sports authority was technically in charge of, of the contracting and the design and construction with heavy input and, and, um, and approvals from STADCO. In this deal, it's reversed. You are tasking STADCO with design and construction responsibility with heavy approvals and oversight of this, of this board. Yeah, I just, I just want to make an observation about why it, it, this is a better structure. You may recall that in order to make things work the way they needed to on the Geodis project, we actually had to have another contract with the team to put them back in charge, effective day-to-day -day control over design and construction. So this removes an agreement and puts the responsibilities where they really need to be. As Jeff is going to mention, the sports authority is going to have uh, the right to engage an overseer so you you'll you'll still have essentially the same um oversight powers that you had in that one it's just a much simpler structure i have a question about that oversight of the sports sure. authority is that going to mean we're going to have to have somebody else on the staff to do the oversight for that stadium or we got to take it out of present staff to do that this is somebody that you can engage, and actually, we're, we're going to hit this yeah. as the presentation goes on, but um, the, the objective is to hire a, an outside firm okay. with revenues that are not part of your, your current budget, but okay. generated by the project to be able to do this. Yeah, it's a really important question, and, and, that's, and we're gonna, that's next. I guess the last, last thing before we leave here, you know, you're, um, you know, you were responsible for Geodis Park, and so obviously procurement standards apply. Do they apply if the team Stadco's task? Yes, they do because it's it's being constructed on your behalf. So, um, next slide, please. Oh, sure. Um, so, so if you want to look at the development agreement and you want to go to section two, um, you know, section two is a pretty simple section and it talks about representatives of the parties. And you'll see in section two point one that you you're designating your executive director as your sort of authority representative. And I just wanted to use this section maybe as a, as a launching point to talk about, get to your question. 
who's who in this construction process, what people do you have at your disposal, who's going to play what role in oversight uh, when it comes to development and construction. And so here are the parties. You know who STADCO is. We've talked about that. STADCO has a representative you see in Section 2.2. Their role, just like your executive director's role, really is to give and receive notices. You're going to see that Stadco has lenders just like you have a lender. You know, your bondholders, you know, they're your lender. Stadco's going to have lenders. That's, that's important. You'll see that in a minute. Um, their lenders will have an agent. Um, so that's on the Stadco side. There will be a construction monitor. And um, a construction monitor, the way, you, the way to think about this is, Again, I'm asking Tom to correct me if I go astray. Is you know, Stadco will will borrow funds to get this built. You will borrow funds to get this built. Everybody is intensely interested that everything go well and right, and that it that it be, you know, there be regular reporting. Everybody knows exactly what's going on, and so there will be a construction monitor who works for everybody, who reports to everybody about how the project's going, and so you'll you'll see that role. You get to approve. They will. They will propose somebody to serve in that role. You. This board gets to approve that entity. So that will be. That will be a uh, an engineering firm that knows how to do these things. Projects of this size and scope. So that's one bit of oversight. Um, for what it's worth, you know, on all these things like, okay, who is it, and then how are they being paid? That would be funded from the project budget. So not nothing you would have to write a check for out of sports authority funds. <clears throat> um, last, when we get to the, um, to the authority itself, and you know, we've talked about your sort of authority representative, your executive director could give and receive notices. You, you will act as a board when approvals are required, you will give them. Um, and then you will see an additional um, entity, an authority construction representative that you have the ability to, um, to engage who can provide additional oversight and reporting back to you so that you're fully up to speed on what's going on. That too is paid from the project budget. And as an example, who does that on Geotis? <clears throat> we, didn't, we did not have exactly the same structure on Geotis, but uh, Ron Gobble, I think, is here, and, and he was sort of the authority's representative to oversee the construction project. And actually, there CPS. NCPS, right, NCPS. Yes. And so you, you guys saw them regularly to report on what was going on. And, you know, they had a, a heavy role both in while the design was underway and also during construction to uh, review change orders and pay apps and things like that. And, you know, make sure that the process runs smoothly and the board gets the, the information on which it needs to base, base decisions as the project goes along. So since this is optional, would the authority have the power to do that would be? this construction representative? I, I missed part of your question, I'm sorry. So who would determine who that construction representative would be? For the be? authority, it will be you. you. Okay, so we have that. Yeah. So, uh, a sure. question on the, on the uh, construction monitor, um, and I guess this uh, also is, is part of what uh, uh, Chair Bender uh, was asking. Um, I. For some reason, it was a lot. I tried to go through some of this, and I'm still confused. But for some reason, I thought that, uh, what do you call it, state coach? State Stadco. Stadco. Yeah. Stadco yeah. Uh, would hire the construction monitor. The, they, they will. And, they will engage them as a project cost, but it's one of those things, and there are several in here. They, <clears throat> they engage them, but you get to approve it. You get to approve the entity. Okay. And... Uh, uh, in this, it was saying that the construction monitor um, would not be required to deliver any reporting. Somehow, I'm missing what's happening. Is this, uh, will the construction monitor be responsible for um, services uh, that would parallel those of um, the architect, or the engineers on the project? I mean, is that no, so the, uh, the, the way I think of them, again, I'm asking Tommy, this is once construction gets started, mm -hmm. the construction monitor is going to be following progress of construction, invoicing, payments, everything related to progress of construction, and they are going to be reporting to both you and to Stadco how that's going. And, and I think it remains to be seen exactly the, the, the rhythm of that. 
but there are other reporting uh, processes in here that when the dust settles, it's going to be monthly. You know, you're going to be getting monthly um, updates. Okay. What will the architect be doing? What will the engineers be doing? So, okay, so all, so these are, so let's go to this slide. These are all perfect questions. So th this slide, and, and if you go to, um, yeah, go ahead. Can I mention one more thing? The, the, there was sort of a similar arrangement during construction of Geotis. The team did have a construction monitor mm -hmm. in addition to Metro's representatives. This is a separate thing, but they worked collaboratively. Just, the, somebody needs to be overseeing, because nobody, nobody on a typical owner's uh, staff has the kind of expertise that's necessary to make sure that stuff is being built in accordance with the plans and specs. So this, you know, this firm, in, in that case, I think it was Icon, they, they, uh, you know, they had somebody there, lots of somebody's every single day watching to make sure the construction was going according to the plans. You know, when, when change orders are necessary, they, they did the initial processing sort of collaboratively with, with our representatives. Okay. And that's kind of similar to what's envisioned here. Go if you have the slides in front of you, go to slide nine. And I'll say that this slide, when I said my inclinations try to do too much too fast, this slide will uh, confirm that for you. Um, so, but let's go over to the right hand side. So, let's just go to Stadco. Like, you know, what are their responsibilities under this? You know, and we talked about this as compared to Geodis Park. They're going to be responsible for engaging the people who are going to design and construct this, this building. So, they will engage the architect, the construction manager, they'll prepare the budget, they'll prepare a schedule. Your role, as opposed to Geodis Park, where it was inverted, is you get to review and approve all those things. Who that is, those contracts, that budget, you get to re review all that. So Stadco is engaging all those people. When it comes time to do the work, those people will do the work pursuant to those contracts. That's, that's what's going on there. So then the construction monitor will oversee, they're sort of sitting at the top, oversee how all of that's going and report on that both to Stadco and to you. That's, that's one big thing. The other thing that you'll see in here is that the development agreement, and we'll get into the exact provisions where this falls. This is really just sort of an overview. Stadco has a monthly reporting requirement to you really on exactly those same things. How's it going? And so you then get the benefit of the Stadco monthly reports, the construction monitor reporting, and then you get, if you go down to the bottom left, you have the option if you want to engage your own authority construction representative to receive, filter, aggregate, <coughs> all that information for you so that what you're getting is useful and effective. That's what's going on on this very busy slide. Hey, Jeff. Um, sure. Really quick question um, about the arrows. So yeah. it says here, it, well, the arrow is showing that the sports authority has an arrow, arrow towards the bond hold, mm -hmm. the, yeah. the, the bond holders. Can you right. explain that arrow? Yeah. So just like, um, you know, you're, you're going to, and, and we're going to talk in a lot more depth about the plan finance. <clears throat> you will issue bonds just like you did for Geodis Park. And, and you've done for, for your other facilities, you'll issue bonds, you'll borrow money to fund the $760 million contribution, and you're gonna, and you're gonna repay them. That's just sort of indicating that you've got a debt to those bondholders. It's worth noting, so bondholders, and then if you wanna go to the other side of the page, Stadco lenders, both of those entities are, are very interested in making sure this building gets built and, and, and built on time because they're counting on the new building you know, to, so that all these debts can be paid. And that's why there will be one of several reasons why there will be a construction monitor to make sure nothing's falling through the cracks as things are going along. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. I got a question. That optional added oversight, mm -hmm. is that in addition to the original we talked about just a little while ago? So would we have two people if we chose <clears throat> to pick up another oversight person? Yeah, so the construction monitor, you know, as you correctly pointed out, the construction monitor is engaged by Stadco, approved by you, reporting to everybody. The authority construction rep is the additional entity that you could engage directly, working solely for you. And we pay for it? Out of the project budget. The project budget, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Next slide, please. So, now let's... 
that was a long time on Article 2, but we, we, co we covered a lot. Of, and, and, and I think it'll make more sense. We've laid the groundwork for, as we go through this, and I think we can go a little more quickly. I'm going to skip a fair amount of Article 3, because Article 3 talks about, okay, how's this thing getting paid for up front? And, and a few things are obvious, things about everybody's been talking about for months now. How much is the authority bringing to the table? $760 million. You'll see that in 3.2A1 on page four. You'll see that, you know, the state's coming in for $500 million. That's in here. And then, um, and then sort of the, the, the team uh, is then uh, on the rest of it. The re a lot of the rest of section three, article three, talks about exactly when and how bonds are issued. I think it's better for today's purposes. Let's let's leave that for the plan of finance discussion and let's stick to sort of more landlord responsibilities. I think it'll take all day to cover that stuff and we can have a better discussion about that. Um, so let's let's do that. We've talked in section 3.5 G. There's a the section regarding the construction monitor. I think we've hit on it pretty well. If you want to talk about it some more, we can. That's in section 3.5 G. That's that's Article Three. Article Four. If you make me spend time on it, I'm going to be aggravated. Reps and warranties, <laughs> awful stuff. Um, Article Five is also pretty straightforward stuff. You're identifying the site where this is going to be. We all know where that is. You've seen that. Stadco's given access to that site to do the developing work. Stadco's accepting that land as is. That's pretty pretty straightforward stuff. Article six is also pretty straightforward. They got to get permits, licenses, and approvals necessary to, to do the work, and you got to cooperate, you know, in helping them get those things. That's all pretty straightforward. <clears throat> and then you get to section seven, and I don't think there's anything, um, I don't think there's anything sort of uh, controversial about article seven, but article seven is where all the action is, you know, for, for um, yeah, sure. I think, um, seven. That shall at all times indemnify defend the authority. Is that right? What section are you? Uh, seven thirteen. Oh yeah, yeah. That's 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 kind of no. Well, actually, ahead, no, 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 no. That, that's good. We want. That's absolutely important. Excuse me, Jim. Sure. Are you going to be available for questions outside of this? Because I know we just blew through that, but I mean, I don't perceive any of this as just straightforward. Yeah. So I do want to. Be able yeah. to have an, an opportunity to discuss further. That, that's perfectly fair. And listen, <laughs> and the other thing, in, in addition to going too too fast and too much, is to Kelly's been saying this for we have lived with this now for several months, and we take for granted stuff, you know, just because we've been living with it. So you're exactly right, and we're absolutely free to talk talk about any and all provisions. Excellent. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So 7.1 is where really all the action is when you think about your um, sort of the, the design and construction. I yeah. apologize. I believe I called you Jim. I've been called worse. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, I wanted to address you by your name. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Um, so so our section 7.1, we've sort of hit on this. It's the in, in, inverted Geodis Park. Stadco is responsible for design development construction and, and what is it they're designing, developing and constructing? It's the enabling work, which is the site prep, on-site environmental utilities work. It's the stadium construction itself, no brainer there. It's off-site utility relocation and specifically there's a there's a sewer main and a natural gas yeah. natural gas line that have to be rerouted. Um, that's yeah. that's part of the work. And then at the, the, their very last thing is the demolition of Nissan Stadium. That's all all part of the project. As we mentioned before, Stadco is required to comply with procurement processes. That's section 7.1. Um, section 7.2, you know, we talked about on that really busy slide about, about the, that red box, the people that Stadco was going to engage to get this thing done. You know, the architect's the first thing out of the gate, got to get it designed. Construction managers next got to get it built. You have the they will they will propose those entities and they will propose contracts for those entities, and this board will get to approve uh, approve those. And so that's 
That's how that works. That's in section 7.2. Sections 7.10 and 7.12, and I know this is fast, and I'm sorry, <clears throat> establish some baseline standards for what's got to be in those contracts. Just some basic, um, just basic provisions, and this really is in Tom's world of things you just have to have in a, in a proper architect and construction manager agreement, you know, with a governmental entity for a project like this. So you, you'll see that. Um, that's what's in section 7.2. Quick, quick sure. reminder that, that we used a uh, construction manager for the Geodis project as well. And for that type of project, you engage the designer and the CM at the same time, and they work collaboratively during the design. And the hope in generally borne out is you have far fewer change orders in a project like that since the CM, by the time you arrive at a price for the construction, you should be intimately familiar with the design. And, and also has an opportunity to point out constructability problems in the design. So for, for Metro, th that has been a pretty successful delivery mechanism and uh, it's good for everybody probably in this, in this relationship. Uh, question, uh, would the construction manager, construction manager at risk, uh, no, would the architect for the project um, have an opportunity to select uh, the construction manager at risk? I mean, is there a process where you might consider uh, a number of firms and then they would go through the qualification uh, procedure? This, this is one Jeff mentioned a minute ago that they have to follow Metro's procurement process. This is a public project with mostly public money in it mm -hmm. and it's being done for you. So they have to follow our rules and, and Metro's rules generally applicable to other government entities in Tennessee would be some sort of a competitive selection process. The architect doesn't generally have a role in that, although there aren't many architectural firms that are capable of doing a project this size. And I'm sure they would take their comments into consideration about, you know, who, who's capable of doing the work as a CM too. I'm sure, I'm sure they, would, they would consult with the, with the architect but the architect is not going to be deciding who the CM is either. Okay, and, and at this point, we have no idea who the architect or construction manager at risk, all of those are. We have no idea. Um, I, I think you could probably guess who the, the, who the uh, pool of architectural firms is who could do a project this size. You know, and I don't know, this is, the Titans are going to be handling this, but Populous shows up on every, one, every stadium project, so I'm sure they'd be interested in it. There aren't. There may be only three or four other firms, and they, they obviously they hire a lot of subconsultant architectural firms and engineering firms to help them with the work. But I don't know who they're who they're they're thinking about. But the process is going to be competitive in the same way that it would be if Metro were doing it. You, you don't you don't low bid uh, architectural services or any other kind of professional services under state law. Done. You know the selection is supposed to be based on recognized competence and integrity. And you know, you take those into account, but also who can do it and who's done other great projects. I'm sure that's, that's oh, where and, and I understand. I was just, I was just curious as to, uh, and, and I know the architect wouldn't necessarily select uh, the construction manager at risk, but I was thinking that he would be involved with Metro, once Metro, I mean, with the stadium. Statco. Yep. Statco. Uh, he would be involved with them. Uh, in the selection process of that. I mean, just given his input. That, I'm, I'm, sure there, I'm sure that's, that's going to be part of the selection okay. process. You don't, you don't want to jam together a big architectural firm and a big CM okay. who can't work together. Right. Okay, all right. Tom, can you, um, because I, I, what I have seen is it talks about the architect of record. So how does that is that different? Usually the, well, no, that's usually, that's usually the, the primary architectural firm that's responsible for design of the project. But there isn't a firm that could do all of this work by itself. Somebody has to stamp the plans, and that's the architect of record. But there, there will be a long list of other designers and subconsultants that work on the project. One of the things, particularly for a dome stadium, is you know, the, the structural part of the roof, it requires real expertise. You have to have these giant spans where there's no... There's no support on the 50-yard line, so they hire they hire structural engineers and lots of other engineers and other designers who have expertise in particular areas. But the designer of record, architect of record, is the is the main architect who stamps all the plans. And you, know, you asked a good question. You know, there are two ways to you, 
all this could have been fully baked and you could be showing up and you would have a development agreement that says, we approve so-and-so, we approve so-and-so, and, and that's not how this is. Um, all of this is to come. And so everything in section seven, article seven, is phrased in the future. They, they propose, you approve. And, and we have a slide on that sort of little walk through how that all might time out. Next slide, please. Um, more pre-construction, we're still in the pre-construction world you know, before we put a shovel on the ground necessarily. So plans and specs then, um, the, the STATCO will propose those to you for your approval. There are some baseline specifications that are already in Exhibit E to the, um, to the development agreement. Um, there is the concept in the development agreement that the design has to, has to adhere to the quote unquote facility standard which is first class and consistent with comparable facilities. Um, the design, uh, we understand from the state, will also include 10,000 enclosed square feet for the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. Um, you have a right to approve, the, this board has the right to approve plans. And last, the, you know, the goal is to achieve LEED Gold certification. Jeff, I have a question about that. Sure. Section um, 73 b yeah. addressing lead certification is the goal of the parties. Is there an enforcement mechanism or any sort of penalty for failure to attain that certification or is this simply a statement of intent? It's, it's just <clears throat> aspirational. That if, if it were a metro project, it probably would be required to, to adhere to the lead silver status. This is, they're, they're, they're shooting higher, but everybody expects them to be able to get there. Thank you. And then, uh, yeah, next slide. So, um, you know, then we're, we're sort of continuing down the line of pre-construction activities. And as things get further developed, there will be a budget for the project um, that, that this board um, has the right to approve. And then immediately, sort of right before construction, STADCO will, will show up with a projected project improvements construction schedule, a schedule, you know, for, for construction. And so let's just, if you will, let's then go over to this, to this next slide, slide 15. Here's sort of the timeline of, um, you know, again, pre-construction before re the, re the real work starts. I didn't have room on this slide to put it, but you know, the bottom part is, is you, you know, it's the sports authority. The top half is STADCO. And so you can just sort of see along the way, they're going to propose an architect. You're going to approve an architect. They're going to propose an architectural agreement. You're going to approve it. They're going to come with plans and specs. You're going to approve it. There'll probably be a little bit of time lag there. They'll come with a proposed construction manager. You have an approval right. Construction agreement, budget, then a schedule, then commencement of construction. So if you, you know, if, if all the powers that be approve this deal, this is what this board's life is going to look like in the next months, you know, following following that approval. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I asked a question some time ago. But I, don't, I don't know that it was in the meeting, but I did ask the question of whether or not there would be a consideration for a competition for this project. Do you know if that was consideration by Statco for a competition for the project? Do you mean on the architectural services? Yes. Let me, let me, because I know that uh, there's been some discussion about Manica, who is also already working for the Titans. Mm -hmm. um, in order to develop a project budget that's got any kind of validity to it, you, you would need somebody to do kind of a high level, you know, here's, here's what the project could look like. And it can't just be... Um, elevation drawings, you know, there has to be enough detail to it so you can get people to give you um, reasonable pricing information about what, what would, would be entailed. So it, it, we, would, we would not be here without something like that. So the Titans have got Manica doing that kind of work. There's going to be another, you know, the, the architect of record for the project that really does all of the, the detailed design. So I just want to clarify that. So the, the, there, there is sort of a competition, but again, you can't low bid um, professional services, including architectural services. The competition generally involves 
um, you know, not what, what is the price that you're going to charge. I'm sure that's a factor, but um, who do you have on the team? What other projects have you done? What kind of vision do you have? And, but the, the baseline is kind of the initial work that Manicat has done. I'm not sure I answered your question, but... Uh, It'll suffice. Okay. <laughs> I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Um, I noticed strategically there's no dates on this timeline. So I was just curious, in a perfect scenario with all the movie parts, what is the timeline of this? I guess I would I'd defer, to, I'd defer to the team to, to, to speak to that. I, Dan Roy, really CEO of the Titans. I, I think some of the states are probably a little bit more firm than others. So, um, you know, we, we got to hit approval first before any of this happens. And then it kind of falls. So approval, we're hoping to achieve that in April of this year. Um, and then all the way at the end of the next end there, commencement of construction, would be around next summer. So everything else kind of falls in the middle. I don't have exact dates for you, but you can kind of see how that stuff would uh, would start to move. I think as this chart indicates, the first thing would be the architect uh, of record, um, which would be you know, sometime pretty close following um, the approval. And then as we start moving on, uh, there's some strategic ways on, on um, when we would hire our CM, our construction manager, based on pricing and things like that. Um, so that would, that would fall later in this year, and then, and then onward from there. Um, and the budget proposed and approved piece, we can't have that until we have the construction manager come in and actually price everything too. So um, and we've been informally working with, with those folks to have a good idea about pricing, but we have to, um, as Tom elaborated on, go through the RFP process. So that's the general time frame. And I'm sorry, I can't give you like exact dates on everything. They're just a little bit fluid depending on uh, a few factors. Thank you. Will there be guidelines for the architect and the construction manager at risk to work together. Yes. I mean, no, when I, I say that, I mean, to sit down uh, continually through the process of developing the drawings and what have you, not just get to, say, a um, schematic design phase completion and then give it to a construction man manager at risk and he comes up with a price. But I might have to defer to Dan on exactly what they're, they envision, but generally you hire them around the same time so that they can work together through design. It's supposed to be a collaboration, and in order for you to get the benefits of that as the owner, they really need to do that because you're going to... And we'd be ensured that they will do that. Yeah, the, 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 they're both required in, in standard contracts, and again, you're going, to be, you're going to have the opportunity to approve these contracts. They're, they're generally our requirements that they work together collaboratively, and the process just doesn't work if they don't. Well, I understand. I've seen it where they don't work together, right. and you end up with a lot of problems. So that's why I was asking. Okay. Yeah. Good question. All right. So, what happens if the architect is proposed and they're not approved? <clears throat> uh, well, I mean, you 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 have a legitimate approval, right? This is not supposed yeah. to be just a rubber stamp. Um, it, it is highly unlikely that the Titans would propose somebody to you that isn't qualified to do the work or, or that you would consider to be an unacceptable choice. But if that were to occur um, and, you, and you were to disapprove, they would have to get somebody else. And, and, I, and I'll say, and you know, you, you can read this in, the, in this agreement, in a lot of the places where you have an approval right, there are words right after it that say, not to be unreasonably withheld. And, and, that's, and that's important. Um, you do have a, an approval right. And if, uh, and if you wanted to condition that approval on something reasonable, like we don't believe they'll work with the construction manager, you, you have a right to say no. You don't have the right to say no on a whim. So I just want to be very transparent about that. Yes, you do have a, 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 an approval right. It's not unfettered. Um, it's got, you've got to have some basis for withholding it. But for real life questions like yours, um, that's, that's, that, uh, those are legit, and as Tom said, they have to come back to plan B. Sorry. Before we move off this slide, just following up to um, Dan's comment about approval timeline, just a reminder, for this board, you have the honor and distinction of getting to do an additional set of approvals. So council, um, and you will approve, hopefully, this set of documents, and if that is the case, we will be back to you probably 
early in the summer to ask you to approve the bond resolution, which is typical part of everything. I just, you're not done done until that, that last package gets completed. Can I make one other, yep. one other note about the selection process? I think that the Titans plan to use uh, maybe Executive Director Faulknutson and the Planning Director on their selection committee to, to review the RFPs. For the, for, I know for the architect. For the, for the designer, right. So there, there's a, like another level there. You, we, we should know quite a bit about who they're, who they're considering and, and the, the, their qualifications just through our, your representative and Metro's on this panel. What was that tentative date again for issuing the bonds? I don't know when we will issue, but we will come back with the bond resolution, which will be the last set of documents. So that's the um, indenture, really, really the, the meat of the bond documents. It doesn't mean we have to issue with any certain period of time. It's just the last set of documents that would afford us the ability to issue. And, and that's and that's the that's the same process you pursued in Geo's part. You know, the deal documents were first, and the and the bond documents came later. I'm just saying, don't start your summer. Until we voted on that one. <laughs> We're talking about two. So any other, so this is the, this is pre-construction. Any more questions about this? If not, we'll move sort of the, now to the construction phase. And so, you know, if you skim through the balance of Article 7, and then in some other sections, we'll list them here, you'll see the various requirements um, for the construction process itself. You know, Section 7.8, they've got to diligent, diligently pursue completion, comply with law, uh, minority contractor participation that meets or exceeds uh, Metro code goals. That is in, uh, that's in Section 7.8C. Um, section 9 targets a substantial completion date of June 128, but don't, don't read into that something that's not true. I think everybody's expectation is it is at least August of 2027, but that substantial completion date is a trigger for an event of default. So you don't want to set that one too soon. So it's that's a that's a plenty of cushion date. So Jeff, remind us again what the Metro Minority Contractor mm -hmm. Participation Rate is, and it says uh, good faith efforts. What happens if we're not able to find viable or? If uh, there's not a, the Metro code doesn't have a, like a, a set aside that a certain percentage of, of the work has to go to um, minorities or anything else. They do set goals based on the availability of uh, minority owned firms in particular trades. And you're required to, you know, as, the, as a general contractor or a CM, you're, you're required to work pretty hard to make sure that you, that you do get there. They, they will set a goal. And I will say that on Geodis Park, um, I think they exceeded it just about everywhere. You, you, you have to get, you have to get started early. You can't wait until the project is 75% complete, or you'll, well, you'll never, never do it. But it just isn't true that you can't, you can't get there. <clears throat> we, we we know from our own experience right. that if you work at it, you will get that kind of participation. Exactly. I was going to say that Geodis was very successful in achieving that goal. They did exceed uh, substantially at times. So. Some of the some of the people who are involved in this project, at least at this point, on behalf of the Titans, worked on that one too. They're going to be well familiar with the stuff. They, they're going to, they're going to have ex existing relationships, and most of the people who who would be seeking this work as a CM are going to be are, are at least going to have a local partner. So there's there's no reason why they can't they can't get there on this one too. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Any um, forgive me, I was reading ahead, and I, I believe I missed part of your answer earlier, but I recall when we first started having this discussion of, about a potential new stadium that the target completion date was the fall of 26. When did that slide, fall of 27? Well, I mean, uh, I don't want to speak for the team. I think, I think they and everybody else would love for it to be August of 26. I think at some point the... the that if you go back a couple of slides to that pre-construction, the, the the duration of that slide will sort of dictate when the opening when the opening day is. So there is still the potential for this stadium to be completed and open for the fall of twenty six in terms of the Titans schedule. Hi, I'm Kate here. I'm the vice president of communications for the team. Um, 
we've said all along that to hold ourselves to some sort of arbitrary date is not in our in our best intentions or the best intentions of the <coughs> process. So as we've gone through this process and as we look at lead time for construction and all of that, 2027 is probably the more likely goal. But 2026 is not out of the question or it is now out of the question because this process has taken longer. I, I think it's hard to say that anything is out of the question, but 2027 is looking more likely. And, and, I'll, and I'll say this, and, and Kelly can speak to this more definitively than me. When we when we think about the finance plan, which hinges in part on an expected completion date, we've targeted 2027. We think that's more likely. The finance plan it, it gets even better. You know, if it, if it turns out to be 26, all upside, mm -hmm. and there's no and there's no rule against it. But um, I think I think we're all operating that the more likely, the more likely answer is 27. Thank you. And I'd like, I'd like to add, if, if, if I may, that the uh, architect and the contractors, CMGC, CM, contracted, construction management at risk, uh, would like to get through uh, as soon as they possibly can because it, it means profit for them. So uh, they would probably push to get done sooner. I think that's a really good point. Everyone's economic incentive is aligned to get the stadium open as fast as possible, right? The construction managers at risk, the team wants uh, a new stadium as fast as possible. We want to be out of the Nissan lease and be able to turn off that pilot as soon as possible. Like we are all aligned on getting the stadium open as, as soon as possible. And I think another thing to remember is, is our current lease agreement with the Titans on the stadium doesn't change until we issue the bonds from this authority. Is that correct? And we're going to have a whole section on that. Okay. Yes. That's a good, you're very, that's a very good point. And that's part one, one more of the incentives where we are aligned on is, is it, there's no reason to invest in, in, in the building at the end of its life when you're building one next door. Okay. So. But to that point, you're waiving the, whatever, I believe $32 million of fees as part of the financing agreement. Any more than that? any accrual of additional upkeep and fees between now and either 26 or 27 when the stadium is opened, does that fall back on the team? A super, <coughs> super good question. Hold it if you don't mind, because we got, we, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to talk about that. That's, I mean, and, and that's, again, I, I'll give credit to your executive director. Let's focus on what it means to be a landlord of, of, that building and this building, you know, for the next three years. And so we got a whole section on that. Thank yeah. you. Good question. Wait, so are you going to cover that section in bonds today or next? Not, not the bonds themselves. You know, his, his specific question was, what about CapEx? You know, who's, who's paying to continue to maintain this building once we get started over there? Yeah, I, I was, t I was yeah. talking about the bond. Oh, the, the bonds. Bond that, are you our, our, our preference is because we have so much work to cover is to talk about that at a later date when right. we can sort of talk right. about it soup to nuts. If you make us, we will. But, no, um, no, no, we'll, we'll, okay. we'll do it when you have Well, I did want to ask, was there a quick yes or a quick no to his question? What's that? Uh, the question in regards to the bonds um, in terms of when they will be released from current stadium to the new stadium. So I think the, the question... I think the answer to your question is, is when would the new bonds be issued? Correct. And, and I don't, you tell me, I think the hope is summer of 23. Okay. And that date's magic for a lot of reasons. Uh, and one of the reasons is, is, or one thing that would happen is the bonds related to this stadium would get retired when those <laughs> new bonds got issued. So that really is, that's the transition date for a lot of things. And, and that's part of the reason we're going to, I think we'd like to talk about bonds sort of separately is there's sort of a whole lot that's going to go on with that that you ought to if i were you i'd want to sit with in one session and hear it and hear it all i think it'll make more sense um but yeah, that's the short answer to the question yeah it made sense he threw it out there so yeah. it was it <laughs> yeah, was no, in no, the no, atmosphere right. so i'm glad we, i yeah. wanted to pull it down thank you we have um within four months after completion that this existing stadium would be demoed so. that's right okay. and then the and the team absorbs all of the demolition that's expense right. as well that's right that's part of the project budget mm -hmm. yep.
Um, so more construction requirements. Um, I hope these aren't shocking. Be nice to the neighbors. Keep the project free from construction liens. Stadco can settle liens under the construction agreement as long as it's gotten given notice and gotten input from the authority. You have the right to access the project site. That should come as no surprise. Part of your oversight, you know, function and ability is for whether it's you or your authority <coughs> construction representative to be able to walk the, walk the site. Um, the next slide, um, limits on tours, comply with law, give you a complete set of documents once it's complete. Those are, those are the construction um, areas. And so, well, let me keep going. So one, now we're out of section, article seven into section nine and 10. Again, uh, these things ought, ought to be things you would expect to see. They would remediate environmental conditions, dispose of waste, you know, in a proper way. Um, I have a question with reference sure. to the uh, environmental conditions of the site. Somewhere in here I read, and you'll have to help me with this, somewhere in here I read that the authority would be responsible for hazardous material found uh, on the site or something like that. Is that is that something that was in that? Uh, so there's sort of you've got the stadium side, and you correct me here if I go astray. If you got the stadium site itself, mm -hmm. they're responsible for environmental within that stadium site. So if it something needs to be remediated on that stadium site, they got to remediate it, and they're also not to create a condition that spreads from the stadium site out to the other parcels. If it's outside the stadium site, it's not theirs. It's it's metros and the authorities. Metro and the authority be responsible for that and also responsible for not sending, you know, environmental conditions onto the stadium site. So everybody's responsible for their own stuff. Their stuff is the stadium site itself. I'm thinking that when the, it, the current stadium was constructed, yep. an environmental assessment was done. So that's correct. Yeah, there, there was. So what's the likelihood that there will be some hazardous material? Um, 100% odds of there being some things that need to be remediated in, in connection with the, with the new stadium project and with redevelopment of the other stuff. Um, Mark Sturdivant, who I think some of you know, um, works for Metro <laughs> as the director of development and was working for MDHA when this stadium was built. And this, this, this collection of properties was sort of light industrial at the time and there was a, there was a lot of stuff now there shouldn't be anything crazy but we know from from what he recalls and from the documents that were generated at the time that there are going to be some things that need to be cleaned up and that's for the entire 130 acres well some of it may have been cleaned up at the time this stadium was built so we wouldn't expect anything right under this under the footprint of this building but in other places there are liable to be some things that need to be just not necessarily super hazardous, but, but things that, that you, you couldn't accept depending on what the use you were going to put it to. Like, you can't have, a, you couldn't put a daycare over something that, that was hazardous, you know, a playground, something like that. If you're going to have a, like an, a concrete pad over something, you're going to build a building or parking garage, you, you can tolerate more stuff that's going to be covered. I know, I know I'm sort of complicating this, but we know, we know there are going to be things that they encounter on the site. And, I, and, I, and you're going to say, well, you just keep putting things off to subsequent meetings, and maybe I am. Oh, wait, go ahead. There's, a, there's another category of discussion, <laughs> which is development of the campus. I'm going to call it that. And I think this, this question, the, the cost will relate directly to, to the development. They'll be incurred when the development occurs. And I think that's a really good question. And, we ought, and when we come back to talk about the broader site, how it's going to be developed, who's responsible for what, that's a, that is, we need to address that question in, in that. Okay. And then one other question. Did we have any uh, breaks planned for this work session? <laughs> <laughs> we don't. <laughs> uh, we'll go ahead. We, we do not. Yes, yeah, we were planning on a couple of hours, so we'd like to get through as much as possible today. Uh, if anyone needs to take a break, feel free to do so. I just didn't want to miss anything. That's all. It's being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 
Director Actons, I know you had a question on 713. I don't want to take some back, uh, a step back, but you had a question about indemnification. I wanted to make sure that we address that if, if we skipped over it or if your question wasn't answered in Jeff's comments already. I, my question associated with the indemnification is what is the expiration of the indemnification? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so for, the, for the authority. Yeah, so and the, and the, um, the development agreement, um, I believe it's, um, I'll, I'll look and see, I believe it's for time or more. I mean, it relates to the, to the development period. Um, once you get into the new lease, there are sort of commensurate indemnification provisions related to the, the new lease period. So you said it, it, it really doesn't have a definitive expiration? Well, it, it's got to relate to this period of time. Okay. It's not, uh, I mean, the, the, the indemnification doesn't pick up. So events it's like and losses stadium opening, that, we'd still be indemnified, of course. But but for events that, that incurred prior to opening. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. Okay. The Thank responsibilities you. under this agreement sort of, the development responsibilities end when the new stadium opens. And so the indemnification would cover things that happen during that period, not things that happen after. But if it happened, you'd still have the right to the indemnification. Though, though not forever. But if you knew yeah. about something, that'd be nice. Have, yeah. You'd have to yeah. assert, yeah. Yeah. certainly would. You would have to assert that within, a, you know, the, whatever the applicable limitations period is. Probably six years. Excuse me, Jeff. Uh, Monica, when we have that finance meeting, will the sports authority's budget be available um, in our package? And I'm just asking because a lot of questions are coming up in the finance piece, and I want to make sure that I have a clear understanding in real time. So even in the consideration of paying for hazard, like where is that included in our budget? Is that included in our 760? Will we be able, like how do we absorb even the possibility of that? So I can wait to get the answer to that, but I would like to make sure that our budget is in front of us so we understand how our budget actually works in the case of a hazard. No. It's, a, it's a different budget. Are you talking okay. about our department budget that the board approved a couple See, of months ago? I, I don't know what so I don't that know. that is a completely, he's talking yeah. about our metro right. administrative budget, which, as you know, is primarily insurance and, uh, okay. and salary. So this is okay. a different, different yeah. bucket. And that's what I that's what I, I thought but I definitely I want to have the, cl the clarity mm -hmm. yeah, so if we have to, if we're paying for something then which bucket There's a project is it coming budget. from okay right. solid so I would like to have the project budget available for the board so that we can kind of uh, correlate the two in the case you know to understand if insurance is covering something or if we've already budgeted for that and then what type of approval is this board responsible for the, the cost of any cleanup is not going to fall on the authority's operating budget under any circumstances. Awesome. But your, but the, but the question in general is the right one. You did mm -hmm. when we start talking financing, you need, yeah. yeah, you need the budget in front of you. Tom's right. When we start talking about campus development, that will not be on your plate. Awesome. Um, let's sort of keep going here. Um, all right, so. We, then we thought, let's let's just sort of aggregate here sort of all the oversight and administrative provisions here in one spot so you can see them rather than sort of hitting them along the way. And this goes back to that really busy slide with all the boxes. Um, Section 3.5G talks about the construction monitor who's going to report to both to everyone about project um, success. Um, you then have the ability to appoint that construction representative who acts on your behalf. And the development agreement requires, Section 17 requires that STADCO give them project access and reporting. Um, STADCO's got to provide you directly uh, monthly project sat status reports. And then you have the annual right to audit proceedings under Section 12.4. And so I think what will happen, and I'll sort of defer to Tom here, is you will develop a rhythm that will probably be on a monthly basis where your, your authority construction representative is collaborating with the construction monitor to get you a concise, effective progress report. And I think the trick with the authority construction representative will be to thread the needle between making sure you're getting every bit of information you need, but avoiding the too many cooks in the kitchen problem. And so if the construction monitor reporting is really robust and good and timely, you know, your authority construction representative may can play a more <coughs> limited role 
if there if there are any cracks in that process, you then have somebody who can make sure that's that's getting patched up. I have a question on sure. excluded cost. Um, am I in the right place? Eleven point four and eleven point four, and then uh, article. Article eleven, page yeah. twenty-nine of the bill. Twelve, twelve point four. Um, excluded cost is uh, a, uh, such cost associated with audits shall be excluded cost. Yeah. Is that if, all? Basically, what it means only? is, if you want to audit, you got to pay for the audit. <clears throat> okay. And nothing else is excluded cost. Um, the other things, if you go back and look at the defined term, costs incurred as a result of an authority. Where are you I'm sorry, it's on page A6 of the development agreement in the defined terms. It's in Exhibit A. Okay. Yeah, Exhibit page A. Page 6 of Exhibit A. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. And so excluded cost is a defined term, and, and none of these are particularly shocking. One is any costs incurred incurred as a result of your default. Mm -hmm. and, and excluded cost means they don't have to pay for it. So if it's cost because of your default, they don't have to pay for it. Another is is a change order that you've asked for, you know, for your benefit that wasn't part of the plans. And the last is the audit. If you want an audit, you've got to, you've got to pay for it. That's what those things are. <coughs> um, continue on, oh, you're ahead of me. Um, so continue on to uh, oversight and administration. Again, under section 7.6, you, you get to, um, you get to approve modification to quote unquote project submission matters which is um, not the best term in the whole wide world, but it means changes to the project budget, changes to the project team, changes to the construction agreement, <clears throat> change orders that they initiate that would result in cost overruns or failure of the facility to meet the design standard. So material, you know, material changes to the project, the project team, the project process, they've got to come to you for approval. Um, you asked the question about excluded costs, which is a good one. Under Section 11.1, you can you can request a, a change order. We want a such and such, you know, in the building, but the incremental cost is on your dime if you ask for it. So all of the material uh, project submission matters that would all be at the cost of Stacka. Yeah, and so a change, uh, a change could be, a, a change could have a cost, a change could not have a cost. If it has a cost, it's on them. That's, a, that's exactly right. Okay. But, but even whether it has a cost or not, if it's, it's a material good. change, it's still got to come to you for approval. And that's the kind of thing, let's just use, use this one as an example, where your authority construction representative could come in handy. You get a, you get a request to approve something. Well, you know, it'd be nice to have an engineering kind of person to say, here's what they're asking for, here's the implication, here's my recommendation. So you can make a prompt, informed decision. Uh, let's see, next slide. So again, just sort of in the same way that we had that slide with what your next few months will look like from a pre-construction process, I just thought we'd just have one slide where we put everything on one page. On the left is everything that STATCO has to do to provide you reports and make requests to you and then list. And these don't sort of, these don't correspond across the page, but just a laundry list then on the right side of what your, what your rights are. And again, this is during the construction process. Um, those are, those are your rights. Um, let's, let's keep going. And then, and, um, Aaron, I'll go back to your question. Um, I'm getting ready to like go real fast. There are a bunch of sections. We're happy to answer questions about these too. Um, this isn't always true, but a lot of times when you get toward the back. Jeff. Yeah. Jeff. Yeah. I just yeah. told you, Jeff, I was strapping you. Uh, the, uh, the um, you know, you get further in the back. I mean, it's um, a, lot of, a lot of sort of boilerplate stuff, but some of it's really important. Um, Article 13, for example, they got to maintain insurance. Article 14 says, what happens if there's a casualty event damage due to a storm, you know, example? What happens if there's a condemnation event? Uh, we hope that there wouldn't be anything like that. Um, 
Article 16 talks about events of default and remedies. And let me just say about that, one of the things that's true of a project like this is once you get going, we're all in this together. Everybody's borrowed money. The building needs to get built. And, uh, and the, just as an example, the idea of we don't like how things are proceeding, we're out. That, that's really not it. We, we, we've got, we got to work together. And so the, <clears throat> the remedies provision specifically leans heavily on your right to make them do what they're supposed to do and vice versa. Um, <clears throat> limits on assignment. Let's, we'll talk about assignment um, more when we get to the stadium lease. Um, Stadco is, is going to likely to borrow funds and it will encumber, it will pledge its leasehold rights. That's mentioned in here. All reviews have to be, you know, um, taken in due diligence and good faith. Um, I'll keep going. Um, again, pretty fast here. Dispute resolution. Um, Article 20, there's, there's action in Article 20, but I don't want to talk about it right now. I want to talk about when we talk about the existing lease amendment. So maybe just put a tech, dog ear that page, whatever you want to do. It's page 45 of the development agreement. Hold that page and let's come back to it. Um, Article 21 is miscellaneous provisions. We shouldn't talk about that. <laughs> so, so now we're gonna sh we're gonna shift here to the existing lease amendment. Any any questions before we do that? <clears throat> um, and so again, this falls under the heading of okay, what's it mean to be the landlord in the next three years? And we've we've now just talked about that property back there. I think, yeah, I think I'm pointing the right way. No, that property over there. I'm sorry. Um, now, and now we're going to talk about this this property um, for the next three years. And so, and this is tab E. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you, tab E. And it's not, you know, it's only three or four pages, but there's there's a lot going on. So the first thing, let's talk about site, the the size of the site and parking. Right now, the premises, on, on, you know, you've got a lease. The premises are the whole thing, the whole campus. And you've got the stadium and you've got parking. The rest of it is encumbered for surface parking for the benefit of the stadium. Under this existing lease amendment, the site shrinks down to the area surrounding this building, the four streets surrounding it. So it's the building itself and there are four S, I'm a J, K, S, and H, maybe, for the parking lots right around it. That's the new stadium site. The rest of it is now no longer part of the lease. And this is another one of the topics that I think we want to talk about when we talk about campus development. We want to talk about parking in more detail when we, when we talk about all that. But the parking responsibility is going to be shifted over to the broader. There's a site coordination agreement that we'll talk about. There's going to be, it, it's, it's the same, basically the same parking, a little bit more limited, but same parking commitment, going to be handled differently. But the lease itself now is just the area um, bounded by these four streets. And then you're only parking, and I'll tell you what, let's do this. Let's go to the next slide just so you can see, and I pulled this, you will readily see that I pulled this off the internet. Um, so... Russell, Second, Victory, Victory Lane, Titans Way, there's your new stadium site. Those four parking lots within the stadium site have been and will continue to be Titans parking 24-7, 365. I think that's how that's been operated. That will continue to be that way. Um, the rest of the property will cease to be under the lease. There will still be parking responsibilities, but you, this this board won't have to worry about that. You'll only be focused about the rectangle around the um, around the site. And just just to be clear, this is just for this interim period. Yeah. And, and Jeff, you're re referencing the amendment to the stadium lease. Yes. <coughs> when this goes in this interim period, to get rid of the existing lease as we know it. We operate under the amended lease. Yeah. And so that's it. And so that's a good question. And, and again, it, it's it's hard to put things off entirely. And to your question about the bonds, so, you know, one question is like, oh, when does all this happen? And the answer is, all at once. 
when we're ready to issue the bonds. And so when we're ready to issue the bonds, a lot will happen, but this existing lease would be amended. Um, and, and then, and then you're going to, you would kick off the development period that we just talked about. And then you would enter this new interim world with this building, um, where, where the things we're talking about would apply until it's torn down. That's exactly right. So if you back to the document itself, if you want to look at section 2.1, 2.1 now says what I just said about parking, S H K and J continue to be, you know, team parking as it always has been. They're responsible for costs related to it. Everything else is going to be handled in the site coordination agreement, which we're going to talk about coming up. But the short story is, is just like environmental liability in the campus, it's not a cost you will have to, you will have to bear. Um, and it all relates, it's not like there's something weird going on. I mean, the whole plan, and you've seen this, you know, the council in December approved a, um, an RFQ for campus development. This all relates to campus development. That's what's going on. Um, if you go to the next slide, this would be no surprise. The, the term is, is um, shortened so that it expires once the new stadium's open. Um, that's, uh, that's no big thing. Um, and then the next, the next slide, um, section 2.2, um, I'm sorry, 2.3F, and there's a typo there, I'm sorry, it's not 2.2F, it's 2.3F. Two big, two big changes in the, in the lease. And th again, these are things I don't think so far, I'm not sure we've talked about anything that's any different than what was in the term sheet that was before you back in the fall. And this is one of those examples. We said all along that, that for the remainder of the life of Nissan Stadium, the capital expense standard would go, would change from what it is now, which is good condition and keep up with comparable facilities it would be changed to a player and patron safety standard. And so you see in section 2.23, sorry, 2.3F, the definition of first class condition, which is where that, that stadium standard was, that's been changed to what I just said, player and patron safety. So Jeff, just to clarify, there is now no longer a requirement to upgrade the stadium to be of contemporaneous quality with other stadiums That's right. throughout the, the term of the lease. That's One, right. Once we issue bonds. Once we issue <laughs> and, and again, this this is, this happens when we're all all in. Everybody, you know, so when we're ready to issue bonds, we're putting our money up, we're all in, then all of the documents that we're talking about today, all the documents in your package will get executed and this will be one of them. And at that point, um, you know, you know, we'll have a, you know, we'll have a facility whose expected remaining life is three years. And so there's just, it's in nobody's interest. I, I misunderstood. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think he's wearing his finance committee hat. Yeah. And that's been that's such fair. a standard yeah. part from that's a right. capital mm -hmm. maintenance to. No, no I, I get it now. I, was, yeah. I think that's just cr critical. No, and, and this is a critical piece of this. And that's why we want to spend time on it today first first and foremost so yeah i'm sorry I, i'm looking at page 27 here on, on the summary and the amendment section 2.2 2. 2, uh the existing lease does not expire to 120 days after the new stadium opens you so Is so that correct? that's a type um yeah so so 120 days after the stadium opens not not when we issue the bonds no that's so so you've got, let's say you issue, the, you issue the bonds to build the new stadium. Okay. The new stadium won't be open. Let's just, for, for talking about it purposes, okay. let's say Labor Day 27, okay. you know. So that means this building will remain in effect and, the, and this lease will remain in effect. And our responsibility stays the same during that time? No, so, so two things happen. The first thing that happens is the, the capital expense expense standard drops from what it is today, the one you've been living with, to a player and patron safety standard. And then we're going to talk about a second shift too okay. that, that is just as important that comes with that. Okay. Um, and so for the remaining life, and the 120 days is tied to the, uh, the window within which they have to demolish 
this stadium, and so it's just intended to all line up. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, we talked about, t and, and I'm there. I think there are a lot of references to 2.2 f. That's my fault. That was a typo. It's 2.3 f. Changes the standard to player and patron safety. 2.2. And, and, you know, you'd have to have the existing lease in front of you, and I'm happy to walk through with, with you, um, and any of us would be, at a different time. Take my word for it, if you want, that the rest of what 2.3 does is it shifts responsibility to the team to pay the costs of this reduced capital expense standard. But I don't want to, I mean, that sounds like, whoa, that's perfect, great. But you are committing, uh, we have identified up to $42 million of funding to meet those obligations from, I think, sort of defined revenue sources. You know, one of the challenges with the current lease and the current standard is sort of the unfunded nature, you know, of the, of the capital expense liability. <clears throat> and so one of our goals, and I'm, you know, Kelly deserves a lot of credit for this, is we need to, for the remaining life of this, we've got to be, um, we've got to be sure that we don't have an unfunded liability. And so the way we've gone about that is to first reduce the standard, second, shift the responsibility to them. And so, for example, if it's $60 million for the remaining life of the lease to keep it up, they got to pay for $60 million. We, and I want to talk about this in a minute, uh, or, or actually very soon, we would re be responsible for reimbursing them for up to 42 million of that from defined revenue sources. And then we're gonna talk about what those defined revenue sources are. But let me, let me stop for a minute and just sum up, I guess what I've said, there's a lot going on here. Three years left on this lease, standard comes down, responsibility for capital expense goes to them, and we commit $42 million that we're getting ready to talk about <clears throat> to offset the cost that they have taken on. I wonder sure. about that. That number is not just picked out of, <clears throat> picked out of the air because um, you may recall when VSG came and spoke to you about the faci facility condition assessment that they, that they had done, they projected some needs for the next three years. And so it, this is more or less matched up against that. That boy took come out of Metro funds. We'll, 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 we'll talk, we'll talk about that. Okay. So yeah. just to Spoiler clarify, alert, no. No, no, the, 30, the existing $36 million that the authority is indebted to the Titans organization for is not encompassed in this 42. That 42 is a separate and additive to, and would cover any additional costs for the next three to four years. That, that's a good question. So. I think we're going to tie all that together here in just a minute. That's that's your your spot on. So you you are three you are three slides ahead consistently. That's good. Um, so here here's where here's the funding for the forty two million dollars. Um, and the, and again and here I told you to dog ear section twenty point one of the development agreement. It's again that's Exhibit A I believe in your package. If you want to go back to that, 20.1 addresses, addresses this. Um, 5.9 million of, of your funds on hand would count toward the $42 million. Sales tax revenues from new stadium PSLs, we put 25 million in there. We don't know what that'll be necessarily, and, um, and it is what it is. Um, if it's less, it's less, more is more. Um, um, that's, <coughs> that's a... Me. What sure. page are you on in the binder? 45. 45. So, yeah, two places. If you want to go... Oh, to, I got it. Yeah, you got it? Okay. And specifically, look at, um, uh, look at you know, s section C there. Talks about the 5.9 million. Um, and section E, and it gets it gets lawyerly and wordy. I'm sorry. Um, section E talks about PSL sales tax revenues. That is another source of funding. You're familiar with Metro's obligation to contribute one million dollars annually into the capital fund. That would continue for the life of, of this. And you know you'll we'll see in the with the new deal, that obligation goes away. Um, but 
but through the life of this lease, it continues on. So that's another, you know, million dollars a year, three million. <coughs> and then the balance, and, and again, we're gonna we're gonna talk this sort of now gets over into the new stadium lease. There is a there is a there is a fund established under the new lease that is funded from uh, any sales tax collections collected in the broader campus development. And we've always talked about those as being for stadium necessary projects. And we've always talked about parking being, uh, you know, an example of a stadium necessary parking uh, uh, cost. Um, uh, continued capital expense at the current facility is also an eligible cost to be paid from that fund. So it, to the extent that any of the revenues are short that we've talked about in the first three bullet points, the balance gets paid there and it's owed when those revenues are available, not before. And so long story short, for you, you, you may rack up up to $42 million of reimbursement obligation as they fund capital expenses, but the payment's not due until the dollars are available. So you don't have a, there's no unfunded nature of this liability anymore. Not coming out of your operating budget. Not coming out of your operating budget. <laughs> Other than the 5.9. No. Gotcha, COVID. Yeah. Well, I have another question, maybe a little bit off the record here, but I think since we've had this stadium here, $4 million a year comes out of the water department. When does that stop with yeah, the new so stadium? So the, and that's a, that's a plan of finance question, but the answer is, is when the, when this lease ends. Okay. When the, so, okay. Yeah. When the present lease ends, the day. Yeah. Okay. Right. Jeff, could you explain what pilot payments are? Sure. Yeah. So that's the question he just asked. Okay. So and we just, now we just take a minute right now and talk about, you know, how has all this been funded under the current lease? And the answer is from day one was a $4 million water and sewer pilot. So if we're going to start at the very beginning, when you say this, you mean the existing bonds, the, not capital. The existing bonds. Um, we can talk about that too, but let's just. Yeah, uh, yeah. Where's, so, where's so to date, to date, all of your capital expense funding is, is is represented with sports authority bonds that you've issued, and those are payable from the four million dollar water and sewer pilot, um, the one million dollar capital fund contribution made to, uh, to the, from the general fund, ticket taxes, and then TSU rent and parking revenues are both two revenue streams are pretty small compared to the others. Those are the revenue streams that have been available. When the, when the new deal happens, the general fund contribution will go away. The pilot will go away. Um, for all practical purposes, the TSU rent and the parking revenues will, will go away the ticket tax will remain. So the, the ticket tax really is the, is the one revenue stream um, that, will, um, that will bleed over. I guess- So you're saying the full meeting goes away at the same time? It'll go, it'll go away when, the, when, the, when the, this, this existing lease expires and the new building opens. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and de-lawyerize this. So yeah. the, the $36 million in CapEx that this authority has approved projects for to date for this stadium out here, there has been no funding source for it. We just said, well, we're good for it. We'll ask Metro, we'll find a way. We've, we've never had an identified revenue source for that. As part of this transaction, the team has agreed to cover that $36 million that's already been spent. So take it away, not our problem anymore. For the period of time between when this document is approved and bonds are issued to when the stadium comes down, how are we going to fund that? And that is the 42 million we're contemplating. And that 42 million comes from the report we saw from the construction um, engineer that came out here months ago and estimated this is what it's going to need to change from comparable stadium condition down to player safety conditions. What does that look like? This deal contemplates the team will cover that 42 million as it comes in, so you will continue to prove, say, yes, we need a new bathroom because it is player safety required. They will pay for it. And as we get these revenue sources that are contemplated in here, 
we will reimburse the team up to 42 million. And if that number ends up being a trillion billion dollars, the team will cover that number above 42 beyond. So I hope. I feel like it was clearer to me when I explained it out loud, but maybe you all got it. <laughs> go, on, go, on, uh, go one slide forward. So, so, this is, so this is what, yeah, that's, you, you did it right. And, and, here, and here's what that slide says. And, and again, we keep going back to this magic date, the, the, the bond issue date. It is a magic date because it really is the date where all things are new and you know, things are old. So, okay, so well, can I just say one more thing about the pilot? And this is for council members that might be watching. Well, these, these documents do not contemplate utilizing the pilot for this transaction beyond the opening date. That does not mean that that pilot couldn't be repurposed for Metro's purposes for a different resource. It just, we're just saying it's not, not, not going to be needed for this transaction. So if council were in 2027 to decide that could be used for something else, that is still an option. We are not, that does, these documents don't speak to the future of that in any way, shape, or form. Should that be decided by the council? <coughs> yeah. Kelly, so yes. you're saying when the new stadium is built and it's being used, that there is no obligation on the general fund for CapEx? Beyond the $1 million that is already earmarked every year, that will continue for the next three years, $3 million. That's, oh, I but when the new stadium the new, opens, I'm talking about when that goes away. Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking no, no. brand new, because no. we hear a lot about that. No that general build, fund dollars. build this big... <coughs> Stadium, and then you know what's it going to cost to to the general fund? So, just no. can you repeat that maybe three times? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> there, this deal, this transaction does not contemplate any annual operating fund subsidy from Metro General to pay for the stadium. So that was finance language. Oh. You've had legalese language now. Maybe what Sam a, can say. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, there, there is no general fund money in the, the new um, the new stadium deal. No general obligation bonds, no general operating fund money. There's nothing. Not even in a fallback position. Uh, there's. Well, I don't want to get into the plan of finance, <laughs> but that's that is that is different than uh, yep. issuing geo bonds to pay for a stadium for a construction fund. We will. We will. I. I don't want to say something because I'll this say, is yeah. important. I appreciate to actually have your finance language. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there will likely be a backstop, as what we've seen on every other sports facility that this entity has built. Will it be the entire 760? No, I won't. I won't bring that deal to council to contemplate. But what that means is, if all the revenues that we project, which we will go over on the 28th in grave detail, if they fall short, and we will have several mechanisms where. Um, it would not be an immediate impact. I think in, in the most conservative scenario, it would be two, maybe three years before we would get through all of the designated reserves beyond the, if we do better and outperform reserves that we could see. Uh, there could be a scenario <coughs> where if revenues fell short and we backstopped a portion of the 760, which would not be the entire amount, that we could be required um, to, Metro could be required to make the shortfall. So it would not, and no scenario would it ever be 760. It would be whatever that annual payment is on just the portion that has the backs up just for the shortfall. After we've depleted like three after, years of reserves. After years of reserves. When we walk through this plan, it, it is unlike anything you will have seen for the stadium. We can compare it to convention center. The amount of reserves and capital fund reserves and debt service reserves and supplemental reserves that we have built into this makes it very unlikely that we would ever see that scenario again. But you never know. No, no one ever heard of COVID until we heard of COVID. So um, you never know what's coming, but we have built in everything that, but, that we can see. But to confirm, there is a metro backstop. There will be a metro backstop. The amount of that we will present on the 20, well, so 27th to council. I, mm -hmm. I think we're still confirming updates with them, but that week, We'll be able to, at both bodies to present a proposal. Great. And I, I can't leave without going back to the lawyer piece of this. <laughs> so if you go to the development agreement, and then this is to Dan to your question um, about, okay, let's walk me through the 36, all that. Section 3.3M of the development agreement, page six of the development agreement says, and again, this is on that magic day when bonds are issued, 
one of the things that happens is that, that STADCO will have waived the capital expense receivable through that date. So that, that covers up to that date. And then we've just talked about what happens after that, that date. And that's in the existing lease amendment. So squish it all together. And, <clears throat> and this building, th this transaction cleans up the, those, addresses the capital expense issues for this building. Like that's, the, that's the hope and the plan and provides a, a funding source for up to 42 million going forward. Um, so I, I'll, I'll, def, I'll defer to the two of you. Um, we can start in on the lease, maybe, and get some big picture concepts if you'd like. Sure. I, I, in, well, I guess before we do that. Let me go back. I'm going to go back to sure. the uh, minority participation um, section, whatever it is. 7.8C, 7, 7. I believe it is. Uh, who will there be any monitoring of that participation and if so who will do it it might be better for the Titans to answer that question but I know they've hired Don Harden's firm to to uh, get that off the ground and make sure that their minority participation program works as it should we have a Was that was that a um, was that a selection process for that? Was there an RFP, an RFQ for for that for what you did in in, in determining who would provide that service for the Titans? No. Okay. Any other questions? Um, so, Jeff, given that we've only got about 10 minutes, we've got a few people with a hard stop at 11. So I think um, what I'd like to do is just allow uh, board members to have any final questions about what we've covered today. And uh, we can pick up at this point at our next mm -hmm. meeting, if that's okay. If you have specific questions, as has been said, feel free to reach out to Monica and she'll connect you with the appropriate persons to address those questions. Yes. I just want to say thank you uh, to our chair and to our staff team for putting this together and formatting this the way you did and um, everyone at the table uh, it's uh, been super helpful. I look forward to many more uh, of these apparently in, in other <laughs> meetings moving forward, but you really compacted things and um, we look forward to hearing more. So thank you guys for yeah. that. And I would concur. It's been great this morning. Uh, I, I did read most of this material, and uh, um, it was very good to really have it broken down in layman's term, get a better understanding. And we certainly appreciate Metro Legal and Metro Finance and uh, the entire administration for ensuring that we're prepared to make important decisions as we move forward in this process. So this officially concludes today's work session. Um, our next work session will be Monday, March 20th. Uh, we're finalizing the location and we'll let you know in a couple of days. The board will additionally meet on March 28th and April 4th. Calendar invites will go out soon. So if there are no further comments from you all, no questions? I would just like to say thank you, Jeff. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.